I am not a prison channel. But Jay, all you talk about is prison. Hmm, right. Yeah, but I'm not a prison channel. But literally all you talk about is prison and things from prison. Right. Remember in the beginning though, I said I'm not looking to do a prison channel. We we'll talk about what happens after, what I do day to day, you know, the road to success. But we would talk about prison every now and then. Right, right, I remember that, but all you talk about is prison. You're a prison channel. Damn, I'm a prison channel. I didn't set out to be a prison channel. I'm damn sure enough a prison channel. Come on, Jay. You got to be the stupidest one. Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. I've missed y'all, man. I had to take some time and step away. I had to uh, find me. I was starting to crack. This was taking its toll on me. Sometimes you just got to let everything go for a little bit and get back to who you are. Y'all seen the intro where I'm talking about I'm not a prison YouTuber. I never set out to be a prison YouTuber. And I'm going to be honest. That's not what I want to be remembered as. It's not my legacy. I don't want the world to look at me as an ex-convict that turned his life around. I want to be looked at as just a man, someone that inspires others, someone that helps others, and that's what I'm going to do. I did a live this past week on Tuesday, and what y'all witnessed was me breaking down. Y'all witnessed pressure-busting pipes. I was going through some things. I was dealing with a lot. And sometimes nothing has to happen for something like that to happen. I'm one of those people that I don't talk about my emotions to people. When I'm going through something, I keep it to myself. I've got friends. I've got guys that'll be like, Jay, you all right? And I say, yeah, I'm all right. But if you ever need somebody to talk to, I'm here. I don't talk to them. When I got stuff going on up here, I don't talk to anybody. I'm the one that's got to be strong at all times. A lot weighs heavy on me. There's a lot on my plate, a lot I'm responsible for with construction. I am responsible for a lot of different families, a lot of men, a lot of careers, people being able to pay their bills. So when I'm not behind this camera, as y'all can see, I'm on a job site. I'm trying my best to hold this construction together and hold this YouTube together and then my day-to-day -day life together and then all the other stresses that just come along with being a man. In that live, I spoke on people. I had no right to do that. I was venting. I'd had so many people reaching out to me for help. And this isn't just advice. This is like financial help. And I'm not talking one or two. I'm talking thousands of people that I got overwhelmed. I'm like, I want so bad to be able to help the world, but I can't help everybody. As much as I would love to just be able to give everybody everything they ever wanted, I can't. So I ended up taking the live down just out of embarrassment. How I conducted myself. Things I said. Speaking on the next man. Who the hell am I to speak on the next man? Or what somebody else has going on? I'm not a cloud chaser. And I wasn't doing it for cloud. I was doing it out of frustration. Irritation. People always want to know about this person. Know about that person. If you want to know about them, hit them up and ask them. It doesn't give me the right to speak on it. We're back on track. I definitely needed to take a break. I needed to do some soul searching. I needed to get back to the root of who Jay is. We're telling these stories day in and day out. Over time, I'm st I've started to feel like that old me. When I relive these stories and I tell you all these things that are going on, it takes me back to a time when I was someone else. When you're doing that every single day, you start to feel like that's who you are. And it's not. I guess to sum it up 
and constantly retelling these stories and reliving the past, you start to get stuck in the past. You start to have to literally relive a life that I'm glad is behind me. I haven't been sleeping well, a lot of nightmares, stuff weighs heavy on my heart, reflecting back on who I once was, things I've been through. When you talk about it every single day, it no longer becomes therapeutic. It just stays fresh. A little too fresh, a little too close for comfort. It starts to guide you in a direction you don't want to go. You start to lose sight of who you really are because you're so caught up in talking about who you were. So this evening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start focusing on getting the podcast and all that stuff set up, all the backdrops put up, all the computers hooked up, all the microphones, cameras, all that stuff into play so that I can start shifting us in the right direction. So I can continue to help the world, but without having to dig so deep into who I am and what I've been through. I can do all that without having to do all that. I want to move this channel into a direction of, of greatness. You know, I'm only human and there's only so much anybody can take. I'm lucky enough that I was able to have the time to step back from doing YouTube for a little bit, step away from the camera and reflect. I'm lucky that I was able to grab a hold of me and my situation before I started to spiral. I hate who I was. I hate the things I've done, the things I've been through. I hate all that stuff so much. And it's hard to constantly have to relive it. There's no therapy in doing it day in and day out, doing it day in, day out, day in, day out. It becomes painful. It gets old. I deleted, I want to say it was like 16 videos that I had made that I was going to post because it became too much. I started looking through them like, which ones am I going to delete? And I just deleted the whole entire folder. So today we're going to talk on Home Sweet Home. How it feels when you've been locked up so long that that starts to feel like your home. And then moving forward after this video, we're still, still touching on these things, but not as much, man. I can't. What we're going to do is we're going to move in a different direction. I want to start having people over, sitting down with people. People that have dealt with different things in life. Because there are a lot of the same people. These are the people that are going through the same things that you are going through. Or some of you are going through. People that deal with addiction. People that deal with homelessness. People that have been victims of crimes. People that have victimized people. People that have dealt with substance abuse problems. I want to deal with current events, things going on in the news, things going on in the world. I want to go travel and meet up with different people and sit down with them face to face, kind of almost become like the like the hood version of Dr. Phil, you know, like just sit and listen, add my two cents when it's needed, I try to take what I do and help others. I love all y'all. And I thank each and every one of y'all for supporting me from day one. But if you go back to my very first videos, I said I'm not a prison YouTuber. Somehow, that's exactly what I've become. So that means that every time I turn on this camera, it's almost like I'm back in prison. I judged another YouTuber a while back. And I'm not ashamed to say that. He had talked on how he was going to try to get away from the prison content that it was taking a toll on his psyche. Mentally, it was messing with him, that he was going to shift his channel in another direction because it's not what he wanted to do. And honestly, I'm looking at him when he's saying this, and I'm like, oh, you just ain't spent enough time locked up. You just you know, ran out of stuff to talk about, so now you're trying to figure out how to make your escape without saying that. But now I get it. I get where he was coming from, and he was right. Nobody wants to relive the worst parts of their life over and over and over and over. Because when you're doing that, then you can't really live the life that you're currently living because you're stuck in the past. 
I'm not going to stay stuck in the past. I'm going to build from here, give y'all more, open up more doors. We're going to move this into a direction nobody else seen coming. We're going to move it into the next phase of what I see going on up here. But I can't get there if I'm stuck back there. So without further ado, home sweet home. And just know that after this, we're going to start moving this in a new direction. I love all y'all. All my real ones are going to be with me. And I have no doubt in that. I know I done seen it. You know I done lived it. So, let's relive it. To a lot of y'all, it's going to sound crazy to say that being locked up inside of an institution, a detention center, a jail, or a prison can start to feel like home. It feels like a home away from home. And that's what it had become for me. I didn't know I was institutionalized. I didn't. It took me a long time. And there was a, a defining moment that really brought me to terms with the fact that I was state struck. State struck meaning this is all I know. This is what I'm best at. This is what I'm used to. And that played a major part in why I continued to get locked up. Why I just didn't care when I was out in the streets. Why I found myself incarcerated time and time again. Anytime you've spent a large majority of time in a certain place, I won't say that you become comfortable because you never truly become comfortable. You kind of become complacent. You're not content. You know, you just come to accept it. I had come to accept and kind of embrace being incarcerated. I remember when Smitty, old man Smitty, Smitty used to keep his floor waxed. I remember the first time he told me to take my shoes off before I came in his cell. And I'm looking at his floor and I can tell he's been in there all night long on his hands and knees with this spray bottle and a rag waxing his floor. Then he would put his little fan on it, let it blow it till he dried. Once it dried, he'd get down on his hands and knees, he'd apply another coat of wax. He must have had 20 coats of wax on that floor. That floor looked like an ice skating ring. You could see your reflection in it. Like you could literally stand and look down and see yourself looking back at you from the floor. I came by Smitty's cell one day. Smitty had the dock job and he had picked up a bunch of tobacco. I passed by him with the maintenance car and he was like, hey, when you get back in, come out my cell. I got something you might want. Smitty was the plug. He could get everything that the guards had taken and confiscated and thrown away. And before he got trash compacted, sent outside the Institute, Smitty could smuggle it right back on in, right? That evening I get in from my job, I go to my cell, get out of my work clothes, take a shower, change into my other clothes, and I go by Smitty's cell, and I step in his cell, and he's like, hey, 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 come on, man. Don't disrespect my house like that. Take your shoes off. I said, your house? I said, this is a cell. He's like, this is my home. That's where I live at. He was right. Even though it's not your home, in the moment that you live there, it is your home. I said, man, I ain't about to take my shoes off before coming in nobody's prison cell. Well, then you can't come in here, stand at the door and talk. We stood at the door and we conducted you no know, business. It wouldn't be maybe four or five months later, I was telling people, take your shoes off before you come inside my cell. I found myself in there in the middle of the night, waxing them floors, trying to make my cell more like home, home sweet home. It had become home. Seven building cell 120. I lived in that cell, that actual cell in that building longer than I had ever lived in one place in my entire life. I knew that cell like the back of my hands. I could, I could still to this day close my eyes, picture the layout what cards I had on the wall, which pictures, where I had my cosmetics, where my shirt hung, 
the, where the toilet was, where the countertops were, the color of the blankets, the color of the walls, it's permanently ingrained inside of my head. It had become my home. Going to that chow hall, getting those trays, that had become like my kitchen. That microwave in the pod had become my kitchen stove. I started to take ownership of things inside the prison that weren't mine. I've stayed strong. Smitty had been down, I want to say around 20 years. Here I am a couple years in. I was stage struck and I didn't even know it. I've been stage struck since a young age. That wouldn't be the first cell that I spent time in. That would be one of the cells I spent the most time in. But that was in reality just one of hundreds of different cells that I had slept in. One of hundred different cells that I guess you could say I called home. I've met guys that did not want to leave prison. Not because they couldn't survive out here in the real world. Not because they didn't have anything to come home to. But because that's all they knew. Prison had become home to them. That's why I said, home sweet home. I had seen people ruin their chances of parole. And their chances of going home. Because they wanted to stay there. I'd seen people get out and intentionally return. Because they missed it there. How could you miss a place like that? How could you miss a place that, to be honest, at times is terrifying? It doesn't have to be you going through anything. But the act of seeing someone else being attacked. And knowing that this person might die. Knowing that there's no one coming to his rescue. And that all you can do is sit by and watch how it plays out. Even though it's not you dealing with it, it's terrifying because that's not normal. But what happens when you start seeing those things and it's no longer terrifying? It's no different than you seeing somebody getting stabbed or somebody getting hurt or assaulted, victimized. It's no different than just watching a car pass you on the interstate. It's the same feeling you get. It's become normal. Oh, home sweet home. Tell y'all Shep's story, man. We called him Shep. His, his last name was Shepard. We just called him Shep for short. Shep was an old guy in my pod that Shep ended up making parole. But while Shep was in the prison, and shout out to Chucky real quick. What up, Chuck? Y'all gonna see the rainbow. <laughs> Question me about the rainbow. While Shep was in the prison, he lived by nothing but the prison rules. He didn't know what it was to be normal. Who he once was, if he ever was once a good person, that person was gone. Shep was down on a murder charge. And my introduction to him would be playing poker with him. He lost everything he had out at the poker table one night. And he did something I hadn't seen done before. I didn't think he was going to pay. He had lost all this money. We got all the, when I say money, I mean commissary. He was one of those people that when he came to the poker game, you made him put his stuff in the bag with everybody else's stuff. There will no be when it's, it's not going to be when it's over, you go get the stuff and bring it to us because he's an old convict. What's to say he's not going to go get a knife and say, hey, I'm not paying what you want to do about it, right? So we'd all agreed that before we start the poker game, everybody must bring their money to the poker table. It must be counted. It must go in the bag and it'll be held in a cell. I watched this man lose out his ass, lose everything, right? I'm a white dude. He's going to pay. I'm expecting there to be problems. End of the night, everybody cashes out. Chef's the loss, all his money. He took it on the chin. Next morning, we get up, we go to child, we come back. I see Shepard go up at another dude's cell. He pulls a knife on him and robs him. Takes all his commissary, takes everything. He stayed true to the poker game, paid his debt. But at the same time, he was a criminal. He had to get back. He couldn't just be broke. So when it robs somebody else, that was his M.O. If Shep needed something, he would pull his knife out, run up in your cell, tell you give it up. Wasn't going to be no fighting. It was going to be him stabbing you, you dying, potentially dying. So most dudes would just break it off when Shep came home. When Shep ran up on you, you already knew what time it was. Give it up. 
dudes are scared to tell on him. A lot of times, dudes will get you gone when you apply that type of pressure. Like, you become a threat to everybody. Guys start telling on you, dropping notes on you, going to administration. They want to get you gone to another prison, put you in another pod. They don't care where you go. They just don't want to deal with you. When nobody messing with Shep. He did this. I seen him do it to gang members, high-ranking gang members. And dudes just tried, you know, they kind of took it on the chin. It was like, just give it to him, man. It's just commissary. Because ain't nobody really trying to die at the end of the day behind some oodles and noodles, some sodas, some shebang chips, and some candy bars, right? Shep goes off parole, and he's at this point, this man's been down. It's got to be 30-plus years when he makes parole. He goes off parole and comes back and tells everybody, my name ain't going to give me no parole. He ain't been in no trouble in a while. In years, he ain't had no institutional charges, known for stabbing people. Just seems to get away with everything, right? Shepard was one of those men that you couldn't picture him as a free man. You couldn't picture him commuting to work in the morning or at Starbucks getting coffee. You couldn't picture him walking down an aisle in Walmart pushing a cart past you. You just couldn't. He was the poster boy for incarcerated. He looked like if you had to like mentally vision what a convict looks like, Shepard fit that to the T. He told everybody, man, they're not going to give me parole. There ain't no point in giving me parole. I don't want to go home. Ain't the world ain't got nothing to offer to me out there. Like, I'm great in here. He messed with those boys. So he was always, man, there's always new boys coming in. Like, this is home to me. They let me out. I ain't going to do nothing but turn around and come back. I'm good in here. I'm not surviving here. You put me out there, man, I end up killing them boys. The boys ain't ready for me to come out into the streets. <clears throat> Pause. Red Bull. They parole Shep. One day Shep comes to us. He says, I'm gone, man. Actually, he's talking to some other. He wasn't talking to me. He's talking to the older guys. I'm gone. What you mean you gone? Man, they paroled me. They let me go. They just let this man go. This guy's a whole entire serial killer. He's a psycho. They let him go. I remember the day he left. I watched him pack his stuff up early that morning. They had the chow hall workers, which get up about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and they head over to the chow hall. They sit out in the pod until they, you know, come over to intercom. Y'all can ask for chow. They got to leave a couple hours early before we get up to start prepping chow for thousands of men. So they get up earlier than all of us. I watched Shepard pack his stuff up and roll out the pod when the chow hall workers rolled out, right? He left that morning before count, which is at 5.30. Fast forward about two years, there's a million more guys just like him, guys that are just meant to be in prison, guys that don't know anything but prison. You've been in here so long now that you forgot what it was to be free. About two years goes by, we get a bunch of new guys in the pod, and in walks Shep. I'm looking, and I'm thinking, did they mess up and not release him? Did he have a, you know, like, some 30-year-old something pop up and they rearrested him. What happened? Other dudes got the same curiosity. We've all still been in here in this time that he's been gone. They go up and talk to him. Shepard went home and killed two people. Said he got out. All this assistance they're supposed to give you and they're going to give you food stamps to help you with housing. Said it was all bullshit. Said he ended up staying with a woman, an older, older woman that he had been talking to, writing letters and stuff to while he was locked up. Somebody he never planned on being with. He ended up going and staying with her out here in Richmond in one of the projects. Said he couldn't get no work. Didn't even really. He said, his words were, he said, I couldn't find a job, but it wasn't like I was really applying myself or really wanted a job. You know what I mean? He's like, I was just, I am who I am. After not being able to get a job, he decides he's going to rob some boys. Robs a boy one night with a knife, puts a knife on him, runs his pocket, takes a gun up off of him. How do you take a gun from somebody with a knife? It's easy when the person holding that knife and the person holding that gun are two different people. When he's holding that gun and you know, all right, I got this knife, but I really kill him. He ain't gonna do nothing with that gun. There's a difference. Shepard holding a knife was much more dangerous than most men holding a gun. He robs this young dude, takes his gun off of him, takes his drugs off of him. 
This is all within like the first few weeks. The following week, he robbed a couple dudes and he killed two of them. When they asked him, the dudes asked him, well, the dudes started fighting back or something. He was like, nah. Like, why'd you kill him? He was like, I mean, why not? He didn't really have an answer. Why not? It was kind of his answer. So here it is. After 30 some years, he's been paroled. Gets out. Doesn't know how to readjust. Kills two people. And comes right back to prison. And seeing him back in prison, you could tell that it was a place he never wanted to leave. It was his home. He went back in a cell, not the same cell, cell on the top tier, set it up, went to commissary, got him a new TV, and he was back like he had never missed a beat. He was blessed to go home. The problem with Shep, and a lot of men just like Shep, is that they get so used to being locked up that it actually becomes home. You can't teach somebody how to be a man. You can't teach somebody that's never gotten up and went to work how to do that. You can't teach somebody responsibility and how to pay bills. It's either something you're going to do or it's something you're not going to do. Shepard's answer to everything was violence. When he needed something... He went and got it, and he got it the hard way. And he was willing to take your life behind taking whatever you had. That would be what sent him back. I was around him for many more years after he returned. And I remember just thinking, you would never be able to tell that he went home. Because he never went home. He left home when he left the prison. When they gave him that original life sentence that he ended up rolling out on, and he went home, he left the comfort, the only comfort that he had ever known. He left the only place that he had ever really called home. In prison, he knew how to survive. In prison, if he was hungry, he knew how to feed himself. He didn't have to worry about the stresses of getting a job or paying bills. Shep was okay. To a lot of these men, prison is the only home they've ever known. It's the only home they will ever know. I've seen so many guys come back and thinking about this video, that's exactly why a lot of them came back. That's when they were at peace. It's where they felt comfortable, content. It's where they wanted to be. They felt safe in the comfort of that six by eight cell. That mat, that thin ass mat they slept on was the bed they were used to. They were used to having chow hall meals prepared and served to them. They were used to playing poker. They were used to walking the yard and smoking roll up cigarettes. What they weren't used to is the life that we all know and love. I don't want any of y'all to first of all ever get yourself locked up. As much as I hate talking about this, there's a purpose to all of it. Don't ever do something to the point that it starts to feel normal. When you've done that much time, that environment, for some, starts to feel normal. Now, there are men that have done more time than Shep that came out and know what it is to be home. They know how much they hate incarceration. Look at Banky Pound. 33 years that man did. If you didn't know he'd been locked up, you'd never know. He has come home and he has made the absolute best of this life, of the life that he has. Not all men can do that. Some men become institutionalized to the point that they don't know what to do when they get out. They don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They wouldn't even know how to start to even begin to pay a bill. They have no trades. They've pissed away their time while they're in there because they never figured they'd get out. They give you a life sentence. You make parole 30 some years into a life sentence. If you got locked up at 20, now you're 50. And I don't know how old Shep was. It's hard to tell because guys stay in such good shape while they're locked up, not you know indulging in all the things that people out here indulge in. So a lot of these guys, a 70-year-old out here and a 70-year-old in prison, 
You look at a 70 year old and be like, damn, what is he, 80? You look at a man in prison at 70 and be like, maybe he's 50. Shep had one of those looks, man. When I ended up getting shipped from there, I remember seeing him sit out at the table while I was toting my stuff over the property. And it was the equivalent, seeing him sit out at the table with them other men was the equivalent of watching somebody sitting at a kitchen table at their house. He was where he wanted to be, where he belonged, and in a place that he never wanted to leave again. And after the two homicides he committed, he'll never leave again. First of all, because Virginia did away with parole in 1995. He had been sentenced prior to that, way before that. So with these two new bodies, there is no parole. Shepard is at home. You know how they say where I lay my head is my home? It's a very true statement. In the 10 years I was gone, prison became normal to me. It started to become all I knew. I had lost touch with the feelings of being a free man. I lost touch with the thoughts of walking into a convenience store or being in a Walmart or sitting down at Thanksgiving like I just did with family members. All I knew was prison. Prison had become my home. I didn't want to know what was going on in the outside world. That was a world that wasn't mine. My life consisted of razor wire fences, going to wreck, chow, holiday packs, phone calls, visits here and there, the chaos that consumed me and it was around me every day. That had become my life. Prison had become my home. I had a guy, I've told y'all this, this young dude came in one time, younger black dude, and I'm just standing at my door, watching him come in, and he comes up to me, and he tells me, he says, you're intimidating, like, not in those exact words, but he kind of broke it down. He was like, man, you look like one of those guys from those movies that belongs in prison. Like, you're intimidating as hell to walk into a pod and see standing there all jacked up in the doorway with an orange beanie on and a pair of Tim's just staring at me as I come through. I kicked it with a dude, told him I'm not no bad dude, just kind of laughed at it. I had become a product of my environment. I had become a convict and that place had become my home. On the day of my release, I did not envision them letting me go. I was scared to death to leave. Because you know what, when I'm looking back on it now, that had become all I know. For the longest time, that's all I knew. I knew prison inside and out. I knew how to move. I knew what to do, what not to do. When even in the real world, we don't always know what to do or not to do. In prison, you're going to either know what to do or not to do because the difference can get you hurt. It's a sad day when you wake up in a prison cell and it doesn't feel strange. It's a sad day when you're kicked back in your bunk with your arms behind your head like the thumbnail and you're watching your TV and you're just chilling. No worries. No stresses. No real responsibilities all you gotta do is stay alive and live to see another day and that's your life home sweet home that is not my life no more it'll never be my life again I pray that someone watching this video before they make a mistake or does something stupid thinks about Shep thinks about the men like Shep think about yourself being locked up so long that you forget what it's like to be free. You forget the feeling of sitting down at Thanksgiving. You never unwrap another present. You never shop for another present. You never lay in a bed with a woman. People are buried, you never get to go to their graves. The life you know is over. You have created a new home, a new life. That cell becomes your house. Everything you own in this world, you have to share and pack inside of a six by eight with another man. Your whole life 
is accumulated into a couple boxes and bags of commissary because of a bad decision. Don't let that be you. Wake up. I appreciate everybody that reached out to me to make sure I was doing okay. I'm always going to be okay. I'm human. I slip up. I mess up. I wish I could say I didn't, but I'm human. I'm just like all of y'all. Only difference is, is, well, I guess I do, I do YouTube. I know what it is to be on the bottom, and I know what it is to be on the top. I know what pressure is. You know, I hope I, I didn't offend anybody in that live. That's why I took it down. It wasn't aimed at anybody. If, if your name wasn't said, I wasn't aiming anything at you. I enjoy helping the world. But y'all have to understand, I'm just one person. How many people do you think honestly reach out to me on a day-to-day -day basis for help? How many people do you think I help? If I can't help somebody, it's not because I don't want to. It's because I can't. I can't save the world. But in doing these videos, I hope that I can save somebody. I love all of y'all. I never want to see y'all fall victim. Have somebody push up on you, threaten you, hurt you. You screaming as somebody's doing something to you, trying to take your life, and there's nobody coming to help you. That's because you didn't take heed to my warning. It's because you didn't listen to what I said in these videos. And you've put yourself in a situation to where prison or jail has become home sweet home. You can say goodbye to everything you had before that. Kiss your girl goodbye, because in due time, she'll move on. Kiss your kids goodbye. Because the time you spent with them on the streets will slowly fade into memories. And the only thing that will keep the memories alive are pictures. Because you create new memories and new things happen. And you have to focus on where you're at. Do better. I love all y'all. I needed this break. I needed to find myself. Not that I was lost. I just felt like I was slipping into becoming who I used to be. You can't relive something like that every single day and think that it doesn't take a toll on you up here because it does. 2022 is going to be an amazing year. We're going to do amazing things in 2022 together. Once again, I love all y'all, and I thank each and every last one of y'all. Thank y'all for the prayers. Thank y'all for looking out for me, for questioning about me. Shout out to Domi. Shout out to DOC TV. Shout out to my homeboy, Kevin, man. He's a real good friend. But anyways, the detention centers, these jails, these institutions, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. Just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones, there are some real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. And you know how we do. Salute. I'm blessed. Stay blessed. Stay free.